time, and we talked about the difference between client side and server side scripting. And the thought kind of goes something like this that client connected to the internet, which connects it to web servers. Client makes request, server responds. Now, we said that by putting code, programming, scripts on the server side, we could make the pages dynamic and do so much more. Instead of simply being static and so we stayed for the spoiler discussion, but we left as soon as the lecture starts. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, all right. Um, by putting scripts here, we can do so much more. We can make it dynamic. That is, we can vary the response based on the user's input, based on the user's geographical location, based on the user's platform, based on all these factors. So we can vary all that by having a script that's responsive to that and having scripts that can interact with the database. And so sort of the heavy lifting of dynamic pay, uh, pages happens on the server side. But the observation was made, this is typically a computer as well. So we might as well tap into its processing power. And Therefore, we sort of divide up the work and do what makes sense on the server side, on the server side, do what makes sense on the client side, on the client side. I did make the observation that you stayed for the spoiler discussion but left as soon as the lecture started. So I had a voicemail. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I understand. I understand. This is no way as interesting as whether Thanos had all of the Infinity Stones or whether you could go back in time to get more or something like that. I've actually been waiting for this part of the Oh class. my god, was, this, was that a spoiler? No, no, no. Okay. You're moving behind, buddy. All right, good. <laughs> all right, so this is also a computer. All right, so it can do some stuff too. And so we're going to use these things to each for their own capabilities and advantage. <laughs> The big advantage this can provide is this can provide the heavy lifting. That way, the client is just talking to a server and getting back HTML, and the client doesn't have to worry about databases or anything like that, all right? The client only needs a web browser then. It doesn't need fancy code to connect to a database or anything like that. All that happens on the server side. So the server does a heavy lifting. So what advantage does the client side provide? The client side provides immediacy because even though it doesn't take long, there is a period of time that it takes to make a request, have it go to the web server, the web server respond, and send it back. At least compared to executing instructions on this machine. All right? So, um, because of that, we can put some code over on the client side, and it can be responsible for some of the work. All right? And the advantage of putting it on the client side is it doesn't have to go all the way through the internet. You get an immediate response. All right? And therefore, we're going to deliver to the client HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And each of these things is responsible for a different aspect of the web page. The content and sort of the logical structure of the web page is in the HTML. The CSS is responsible for the appearance and the physical layout, which I suppose is just an aspect of the appearance. And then finally, the JavaScript is responsible for behavior or interactivity. 
And what do I mean by that? I mean the JavaScript can change any of this stuff based on some action the user takes. All right? So, we can change any aspect of the appearance, we can change any aspect of the content by simply writing JavaScript code to do that. Now, the recipe for JavaScript is sort of like this most of the time. There are exceptions, of course, but JavaScript usually does this. Number one, there is some sort of event that gets the ball rolling. And typically that event is going to be a user interaction. So the user clicks on a button, or the user puts their mouse on something, or whatever. All right, that's an example of a user event. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions uh, to that, like when the page loads is a user event, when the page unloads is a user event. You can make events be timed, so after a certain period of time an event fires off. In Ajax, there's other kinds of events. But for the most part, at least to start out, we're going to consider events as being a user interaction, where the user interacts with an element on the page. All right? Second thing is we use something called the DOM. And DOM stands for Document Object Model. And what that is is a way in code to access anything about the HTML and CSS. Then finally, there's the JavaScript language itself. which we can use along with the DOM to change anything on the page. So, that's the recipe. So, we're going to work through a small example of a web page that uses some JavaScript for some real functionality, and then we'll expand on it. All right? So, and when, when we do that, we'll notice there'll be an event. We're going to point to something on the page using the DOM, and we use a JavaScript instruction to change some aspect of the page. And it's funny that we were talking about spoilers before class, because I always do a Star Wars spoiler example is my first JavaScript one. Okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, we'll do that in... in uh, in uh, a page using JavaScript to implement it. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna start off and we're gonna put the different elements of the page. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a spoiler, and then we're going to have a button that will reveal the spoiler. Okay, so if you don't want to see it, you you don't press the button. All right. So, let's go and let's create our page. And we're going to do it one step at a time. We're going to do the HTML, which is the content of the page. We're going to do the CSS, which is the appearance of the page. And then finally we're going to do the JavaScript, which is going to implement the behavior. So. I'm going to put this up here. If anyone here or watching on the video, if these are legitimately spoilers for Star Wars, the movie came out in the 70s and 80s. You've had plenty of chances 
to, to see this. So I do not feel bad for you. Or turn it off and learn JavaScript some other way. All right? It's your choice. It's the end of the semester, you can tell. I'm getting, uh, getting, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know what the word is. You're getting done. Is, yeah, is, that's the best way I could possibly think of it. So I'm going to put here a paragraph that says, who is Luke's father? And of course, the answer is Yoda. Yeah, if I, if I was on camera, I would give a big wink right now to indicate I'm being tongue-in-cheek. Now, okay, so this is all the HTML we're going to have, because we're going to deliver all this HTML all at once. We're just going to make the spoiler part of it uh, invisible to start. And then I'm going to have a button And it's going to be type equals button, not type equals submit. Because remember, a submit button sends it to the server. And we don't want to send it to the server. We want to keep everything here on the client. All right? So we just want a button to sort of uh, in, uh, initiate the action, the activity. And... Okay, so let's take a look at this. Let's save it as CSS to change the appearance. Okay, so I'm going to put CSS in here. Now I'm not going to do a lot of CSS in here, you know, uh, because we've covered that in a lot of other classes. But I do want to make the CSS enough CSS to make this work. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide the spoiler. So in order to hide the spoiler, I can. Uh, do a couple things, all right? Uh, because I want to show the spoiler as well. I'm going to give a class of spoiler to this, all right? And then I'm going to give it an ID of spoiler one. Why am I going to give it a class and an ID? I'm going to give it a class because I could have more than one spoiler on a page, all right? Uh, and therefore, it makes sense to have a class for them because I don't want to have to write CSS to show, or I'm sorry, to hide every individual spoiler. I just want to say anything that I've defined as a spoiler, uh, I'm going to hide. I'm going to give it an ID because when I click the button to show the spoiler, I need to point to that one specific spoiler. I don't want to unhide all of them. If there's five spoilers on the page, I just want to hide, uh, unhide the other one. So I'm going to give it both a class and an ID, and hopefully we'll see how that works. So I'm going to say class equals spoiler. ID equals spoiler one. Can't type. Now. There's two ways that you can hide something. You can say display none, or you can say visibility hidden. The difference between the two is that if you say display none, then it doesn't take up any space on the, on the page. If you say 
uh, visibility hidden, it still takes up that little bit of space. And you just decide what you want to do. How do you want to have it work? Um, I'm going to put the style right inside of here. So I'm going to say everything that's a spoiler make visibility hidden. All right, so now the page has the appearance that I want. It has the content that I want and the appearance that I want. And if we were to view this again, who is Luke's father? And we don't see that. Notice that also, though, that it takes up the space. All right? So we've done the first two parts of this. Now, we can go... And we can, we, we've set these properties in our initial HTML. Anything that we code in our HTML file, anything we code in the HTML file, we can change via JavaScript. We just have to point to the thing that we want to change, and we have to describe what we want to change. So, when I click this button, what do I want to do? Explain in words what do I want to do. I want to change the visibility of what? Spoiler. Right. I want to change the visibility of spoiler one to visible. All right. So change the visibility of the thing that has the ID, spoiler one, and make it visible. So now what we need to do is we need to learn the DOM expression to say that. All right. So there is a workhorse bit of code in JavaScript that is called document get element by ID. All right, and we're going to use that. That's a way to point to the thing on the page that has a certain ID. So I'm going to start off by putting my event on here. Now typically events start with the word on. In other words, when the user does this. On click, on mouse over, on mouse out. We can look at a list of all the JavaScript events, and we'll cover some of them, but suffice it to say that almost anything that you can think of that the user can do to interact with the page, there's an event for it. So... Here's some common ones. On change. If you change the value of a text box, this event will fire off. On click. If you click on something. On mouse over, on mouse out, on key down, and on load. And then there's a whole mess of other ones. somewhere on this page. We're going to worry about the on click event. So I'm going to put on the button an on click event. So I put on the thing that the user is going to interact with my event. And the user interacts with the button to show the spoiler. The user clicks on the spoiler. So I'm going to say on click equals and then I'm going to enclose in quotes the JavaScript instruction to do that. All right? So, on click equals, and then I have in quotes the, the JavaScript instruction that does it. I use double quotes here. That's important because you actually have two sets of quotes you can use. Double quotes and single quotes. It's important that you keep that straight because the double quotes that I'm using here are going around the whole instruction. So if I have something in my instruction that needs quotes, I can't use double quotes. I have to use single quotes. All right? 
because uh, otherwise it's going to see the double quote and think that it's the end of the instruction and not realize that it's just a double quote. So we'll have an example of that here. So I want to point to the thing on the page that has an ID of spoiler one. Well, the page is called document. So document means I'm looking somewhere on this page. Now, that's not always the case, but that's the case here. I'm looking on this page. You can actually write JavaScript to pop open a, a, a new window and populate that window. So you could be talking about another page, but we're not. We're talking about this page, so that's document. Get element by ID says find the thing on the page that has this ID. All right? And that's what I'm going to put in quotes, the ID that I'm interested in. And I'm interested in the ID of spoiler 1. And notice I use that in double quote, or single quotes rather. If I put double quotes there, it would think that that is the end of the instruction. And that obviously isn't a full instruction, so therefore it's going to blow up. So, document, get element by ID, spoiler one. What does that do? That points to the thing on the page that has an ID of spoiler one. So that points to this paragraph. What do I want to do with that paragraph? I want to change the style of it. So I say dot style. So if I'm making a CSS change, I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to do dot style there. If I'm making an HTML change, I won't put dot style there. Probably most of the examples we go over today will we'll do uh, HTML, uh, I'm sorry, we'll do CSS changes. But we could also do HTML changes. We could, for example, change the uh, image that we show. If we have a little image gallery, we could click on an image and change the big image. We could click on a thumbnail and change the big picture to something else. But we're not going to do that today. What about the style do I want to change? I want to change the visibility. Now, that corresponds to this property. That's simply a different way to point to this property. We can, change, we can set that property in our CSS this way. We can change it in our JavaScript this way. Same property. Anything that you, uh, that you set in, uh, uh, in your HTML and CSS code, you can change via JavaScript. Now, the properties are usually just properties, right? just the name of the property. The only exception to that is if you have a property that includes a underscore. So for example, if I had margin left, that's how you say it in CSS. In JavaScript, you would say margin left. It's the only difference between them is if it's an underscore in the property name, you replace it with, uh, you place the underscore in the first letter with a capital letter. But all the ones that don't have an underscore in them is the name of the property in JavaScript is simply the, the same name as it was in uh, CSS. Yes? Um, so when it comes to the JavaScript, because I know you can do that on an external JavaScript page as uh -huh. well, um, do you just write this from the on click onward on a separate page if you're doing that? An external page? Is that all you would write? No. Okay. If, if you were going to do that, if you're going to go and put your code in a external file, you would write a JavaScript function. Okay. And then you would put the function on a different page. Okay. All right. And we'll, we'll get to functions um, maybe today or may, maybe next time. Now, what do we want to set the value to? We want to set it to hidden. No, we don't want to set it to hidden. It's already hidden. We want to set it to visible. And then we end with a semicolon. So I'm going to make it a little smaller so we can see the whole statement. Uh, 
on click equals. We have our double quotes that go around everything. Document says, this part says, somewhere on the web page, find the thing that has an ID of spoiler one. Point to it. So now we're looking at that. What do we want to change about it? We want to change its style. What do we want to change the style? What about the style do we want to change? We want to change the visibility. Uh, what about the visibility that we want to change? What do we want to set it to? We want to set it equal to visible. Notice within the double quotes that span the whole instruction, the two places we need quotes, we uh, use single quotes. One thing that's a little confusing to students initially is when is uh, when to use quotes or when to not use quotes. Uh, that'll come with time. Essentially, values of things, if it's a string and it's a value of something, it will be enclosed in quotes. Or if it's like the name of an object or the name of a function or the name of a property, it will not be enclosed in quotes. So for you that may have taken uh, visual, uh, not Visual Basic, C Sharp or other things. This is an object. This is a method. This is a property. This is another property. Where these are values, string values. Okay, so let's see this and make sure it works. We go and click that, and it works. Yay. All right. Now, some catches with JavaScript. JavaScript is more like a full-blown programming language, unlike HTML. HTML is uh, really a, a, a language to describe the structure of a document and the content of a document. It's not per se a programming language with assignment statements and loops and if statements. JavaScript is. JavaScript is much harsher and much, much less forgiving than HTML is. All right? And this comes out in a couple different ways. One of the most obvious ways is that JavaScript is case sensitive. So, for example, I didn't arbitrarily make these upper and lower case. All right? It needs to be like this. JavaScript follows what's called camel case, whereas the first word of something is lowercase, each subsequent word is uppercase. So notice get element by ID, the G is the first word, so that's lowercase, the E, the B, and the I are uppercase. Now what happens if I get this wrong? All right. Remember in our first week of HTML, I said what happens if I get this wrong and we did some things. And some things really didn't seem to matter much. Other things sort of blew up. This, if you get something wrong, it will blow up. All right? So let's say I say get element by ID and use a capital D there. What happens doesn't work. How can you tell what happened? Uh, staring at your code is usually not the best solution. But that's a solution that 9 out of 10 students seem to prefer. All right? We're just going to go and look at this and hope that it jumps out at us. And sometimes it will. But yes? Uh, I noticed when you refresh the page, it hit the, the Yoda. Is, so if you refresh the page, does it reset every JavaScript? It, well, it, does, it, it, it doesn't reset the JavaScript so much Is it sets it to the, sets all the properties of everything on the page back to the original state. So refreshing the page is, is like making a new request for the page. So we get a fresh copy of the page and none of the JavaScript has run on that new copy of the page. Okay, what we can do though to help us out rather than staring is, it depends on the browser exactly where it's found, but on just about all browsers there is a set of developers tools Underneath Google Chrome, you click on the little thing here, More Tools, Developer Tools. All right. 
and you get an error. And the error, as anyone has done programming before, the error isn't necessarily always obvious. Uh, it would be great if, you, if it said to you, gee, that should be a lowercase d, all right? But it doesn't. It hints around at it. It speaks very indirectly. In this case, it says, it kind of tells you what's wrong. It says, Star Wars line 15, document get Elma by ID is not a function. Yeah, that did narrow it down a lot. You, you might look and say, well, why isn't that a function? At which case, check the spelling, and so on. So in this case, oh, that's not a function. I thought it was. Let me look up the spelling, and then you would find that it would be a lowercase d. Now, what if I do something in... I say spoiler one instead of spoiler one. Cannot read property style of null. All right. Again, that's kind of cryptic, but if you think about it, it makes sense. What it is saying is that this expression didn't find anything on the page. It found nothing. It found null. All right? And therefore, you can't change the style of nothing. All right? There's nothing to change because it didn't find anything that has an ID of spoiler one. All right? And therefore, if it says something along those lines, like property of null, then check to make sure that you're using the correct ID. Uh, most of the mistakes people make are, are like they'll get the you know they'll get the, the name of uh, the ID wrong they'll get the name of the function wrong uh, and again keep in mind that it's case sensitive that's a very common thing for people to forget about and not type it in exactly right another thing that could go wrong is if you got the quotes wrong if I said something like this, visible is not defined. It's expecting visible to be a variable. And it isn't a variable. There's nothing called visible. It's actually a value of something, and therefore there would need to be quotes around this. Um, let me think what else could go wrong. Oh, go ahead. What if you leave out a period? If you leave out a period. Good, good question. Unexpected identifier. That is the least helpful error message we've seen so far. Other than the fact that at least it told you it was on line 15. So that can... We can look at it. And really, it's not even on line 15, it's line 14. But, hey, it did its best. Other thing that you could be a problem is if you forget and use double quotes in here. All right. Essentially, what will happen is it will think that this is the whole instruction and... Uh, that's not a complete JavaScript instruction, therefore you'll get an error. Unexpected end of input. It, in other words, uh, it recognizes that that's not a complete instruction. It expects there to be more. Okay. Now, we can make it so that if they put their mouse over it, it shows it and hides it. Or it, it shows it. Oh, thank you. All right. So 
I didn't have to click it. I could just put my mouse over it. That's kind of a goofy thing to do with a button, but I just wanted to demonstrate that you could, with another event, you could uh, you could use the same sort of JavaScript code triggered by another event. Yes. Um, I noticed when you like hovered over it, like took it off again, it stayed there. Can you it, think, like another one where like when you, like um, off the mouse. Good question. Can we do that? Let's put this one back the way it was before, and let's do that with our second spoiler. So let's change this one back to on click, and let's put a second spoiler here. You could do it a million different ways. Who is Leia's brother? Oh, I was going to say Han. No, that's weird. Uh, yeah, uh, also Yoda. Why not? We're just going to do everything with Yoda today. So I need to change the idea of this, right? And I'm going to make this a link. All right. href equals pound. That way, if they actually do click it, it will just send them to the top of the page. Um, And I'll do on mouse over to show it. All right. Notice that there's a whole bunch of things. On mouse down, on mouse enter, leave, move, whatever. We'll do on mouse over. So that will show spoiler two. Notice the class is spoiler, so originally it will be hidden. If I put my mouse on this link, it will show the spoiler. Now you want it so that if I take the mouse off of it, it will disappear. How do you think we can do that? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, you, you're like 99% right. We're going to do the same thing except it's going to be on mouse out. The instruction is going to be virtually the same. Document get element by ID, spoiler 2, style visibility, except instead of visibility, I'm going to do what? Hidden. Interesting thing. What does this look like we're possibly leading to? I know that was a very poor question. That's not too far away from a drop down menu. All right. So we're starting out small, but we want to get the concepts down. And then a lot of it is just going to be more. You know, the same thing, just more of it. More extensive CSS to position it. More extensive JavaScript to process it, and so on. All right, what if I wanted to show all? How could I do that? Well, any thoughts? Let's put show, a button. Show all spoilers. Show all spoilers, yeah. Okay, you're right. We could do this a couple different ways. Uh, I'm going to do it the first way uh, by just enumerating the specific IDs that I want to do because I want I don't want to talk about 
uh, that'll be a good uh, one maybe for next time. Uh, well, we got about five minutes left. Yeah, so that'll be a good one for possibly for next time because if you get elements with a class name, you actually could get an array of elements and you'd have to loop through them all. So I, I don't think I'm ready to talk about arrays today. So, okay, I won't. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna do the brute force method here, which in this case there's only two of them, so it's not that brute. All right. But if there was a hundred of them, then it would be definitely a brute force way. So I'm gonna put a button on here that says show all. Now. I could simply duplicate this instruction. Instructions in JavaScript are separated by a semicolon. And I could just put show spoiler one, show spoiler two, or hide spoiler, yeah, show spoiler one, show spoiler two. And that'll work. Shows them both. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is, yeah, it's it's very difficult code to read. All right, especially if you got uh, more. If you had a third, a fourth, a fifth, and so on, that would be very difficult. Does it have to be lined up to read it? Like well, let's see. No, you can do it like that. That makes it a little easier, but still they could clutter up your code. So what are we going to do? We're going to create a function. All right? And I'm going to create a function. And what is a function? Yeah, exactly. In its simplest form, a function is where you give a name to a set of code. And that way you could call that set of code simply by calling the function. All right. Now there's more to it than that, but that's it. A very simplified overview. overview. So I'm going to create a JavaScript function. Now, just like there's a style tag, there's a script tag. And a function starts with the word function. We have the name of the function. I'm going to make the name show all. We have parentheses for arguments to the function. And we don't have any arguments to this function. We'll get into arguments in the function, but we don't have any. Those are parameters that we use. And then we have the curly braces to indicate the start and the end. These are used in many programming languages to simply group instructions together. When you have an if statement, this is the true part of the if, this is a false part of the if. When you have a function, here's the start of the function, here's the end of the function. So I'm going to go put these instructions in here. All right. That's defining the function. When you define the function, that doesn't mean that that code executes. So you define the function by creating a function in a script tag. You call it by giving the name of the function and any given arguments, any needed arguments. In this case, there are no arguments. So notice how this really streamlines my code. All right. One of the things, again, one of the big goals of any kind of coding is to make your code readable so it's easy to go back and change at a later time. Because you know that you're going to need to change your code at some point in the future. So, with all that JavaScript in there before, that really cluttered the code. 
Now, if I'm not interested in the details of this function, I can pretty much just ignore it. All right? I can pretty much ignore it. All right? But if I am interested, I can go and look at the script function that has a show all. So now when I go and view it, show all, and it reads everything. It displays everything. All right. To review, events. You can attach events to any HTML element. They typically relate to actions a user can take on click, on mouse over, on mouse out were the, the three that we looked at today. That's pretty much it about events, other than the fact that there's more events. Document object model is a way to point to something on the page that you want to change. The workhorse of what we're doing now is going to be get element by ID. That's not the only way to refer to something on a page, but it definitely gives you one thing per page, all right? And um, it definitely is probably the most straightforward way to reference an item on the page. Remember, an ID has to be unique. Therefore, document get element by ID will only give you one thing which is exactly what we want. Now, style, visibility, is what we want to change about that element. We want to change its style, we want to change its visibility, and then finally we want to set that equal to visible. Okay. Now, this, these are very simple examples, but we could take them and sort of build on them and start to do some bigger, better things with them, which is what we'll do on Thursday. So... Any questions? Yes. Real quick, um, I know you said that with, if you were calling something by class, you need to do a function. Is there a, a get element by class? Uh, that is a good question. There's get element by tag name. There is a. And I notice it's even worded differently. Get elements by class name. And it'll give you an array. Now, what happens if, this is a good question, what happens if we had two things on the page with an ID of spoiler one? I don't know. I think it's only going to show one of them. All right. Uh, I think it's going to show the first one, yeah. But I, I guess I honestly don't know that for sure. Bottom line, make sure your IDs are unique. Avoid any controversy. No, no, you can't. It will not work for JavaScript purposes. Uh, well, let's try it. So I've made both of them spoiler one. I click that, only the first one shows up. And this one, only the first one still shows up. So yeah, the ID assumes that there's only one of them. And if there's more than one element with that ID, it's not going to work. It'll give you the, in this case, it gave us the first one. I don't know if that's all the time or if there'll be exceptions to that. All right. I'm going to go unlock the lab, then I'll be back.